All right, welcome to today's uh, lesson, which is on section 1.4, calculating the limits. So hopefully you've watched the videos of Dr. Taylor's to go through the, um, the intro problems that are on this section of notes. So I know that he talked with you about these limit laws on the front page. So I'm not going to spend too much time on them, except just to remind you that for limit laws, you know, the, the basic rule of thumb always is either to just plug in the number first and evaluate, which is what some of these are telling you to do. And then the other part is you always want to keep the limit part of the problem with each function. So if the functions are grouped together and the limit is on the outside, you still are asked or being asked to find the limit of each individual function and then doing the operation of those answers, okay? So when you look at numbers two, three, four, five, six, and 12, okay, and possibly seven, um, those are what that's telling you. So if you, let's just look at number two. And again, I know Dr. Taylor went through these, but if you're asked to find the limit, no matter what, so this is a limit as X approaches A of two functions being added together. Well, then your job basically is to find the limit of each function individually and then add those values together. So it's kind of like, this is just a shortcut way to write it. But in actuality, you always keep the limits with each function in a problem, okay? So if there's parentheses around functions, then that means basically you're going to do the limits first and then do the operations second, okay? So good news is there's no need to memorize all these because it's just kind of common sense, okay? There's nothing special about these that you have to actually memorize. So when you get down to the bottom ones, these are more direct substitution. This is just telling you, you know, you're plugging in the value of A to the function and working it out. You're plugging in this value of A into here, A to the N, you're going to work it out. Okay, so most of these are just telling you to do the direct substitution. Okay. And then again, the last one is a, a root function. You're going to do the root first, take the limit first of the function, and then take the root. Okay. All right. So we're going to go through some more of these today, along with some other theorems and definitions. So again, hopefully you worked out those initial problems already. And if not, make sure you go back and do those. I'm not going to do those with you now. There's no reason to do them again. Okay. All right. So, um, on Dr. Taylor's video, the only problem with example one was that he did Part D with you and not part C. So that's the part I'm going to work with you now. Okay. So looking at the graph and again, hopefully you already did this. So you're familiar with this picture that's up here, but we have two functions, function F, which is a continuous function. Um, it has one hole in it. Like it's not continuous. It has a hole over here. Um, but other than that, it, you know, it's pretty much continuous. All the values are going to be where they are. And then you have function G, which is kind of a piecewise function that has a little break in it right here. Okay. All right, so we're going to finish this one up with um, part C. And this is a little different because if, if you remember on part D when he did it, um, you found the limit of f of x, which happened to be 2. And then you found the limit of g of x, which is 0. And so you could multiply that together and come up with 0 as your answer. On this one, we've got a little problem, OK? So first rule, remember, is you want to keep the limits with each function. So this would be the limit as x goes to 1 of f of x, and then plus the limit as x goes to 1 of g of x, okay? So we're going to find each individual function and then add those together if there is a limit. All right, so look at the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x, okay? So we're looking up here. We're going to go to 1. And you'll notice that from the left and from the right-hand side, we're both approaching the same point, which would be 1. Okay, so the limit as x approaches f of x, as I'm sorry, the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x would be 1. 
All right, now, if we go to x approaching 1 and find the limit at g of x, here's 1. So if you'll look from the left side and from, sorry, from the right side, did that backwards, from the right side and from the left side, we are not approaching the same value, okay? So as the limit, as x approaches 1 from the left, we're heading down here till negative 2. And the limit on the right side as we approach 1 from the right-hand side is getting close to 1. Okay, so those are not the same. So that limit does not exist. Remember, it has to be the same on both sides. Well, I can't add 1 to something that doesn't exist. So your answer for part C would just be does not exist. Okay. That's a huge thing with limits. I know if you guys had this already in high school, it makes a little bit more sense to you. And if you're doing this for the first time, that's the big key to all of this is when you're finding the limit. It has to be the same from the left and the right. All right, now number two, he did this video problem with you, the first three parts. So we're going to look at D and E. These are a little simpler because you just have the numbers in front of you. You don't have to do any looking on a, on a graph. Okay, so let's look at uh, part D. Okay, the limit as x approaches a of 1 over f of x minus g of x. So remember, we're going to break that up okay, so that we see the limit with both functions. So we're going to set this up as 1 over the limit as x approaches a of f of x. And then minus the limit as x approaches a of g of x. Okay, and that's what it would look like kind of bringing the limit through just the functions, okay? All right, so one over. Now we just go up to the table or the chart up here and see what I have. So the limit as x approaches a of f of x, okay, gave me that is 10, minus the limit as x approaches a of g of x. Find that value up here, which is zero. So we get one over 10 minus zero, which is just one tenth. Okay. All right. And then lastly, part E, we've got a division problem. So we're going to break up the limit so that we're taking the limit of each individual function. So that would be the limit as x approaches a of g of x. And we're going to divide that by the limit as x approaches a of h of x. Find those values in what was given to you. So the limit as x approaches a of g of x, remember, was 0. The limit as x approaches a of x of h of x is 1. And 0 divided by anything would be 0. Okay? All right. So you kind of just, again, getting familiar with this, looking at a graph, looking at just information given to you. All right, so now we're going to do some algebra. We're going to look at limits the algebraic way. Okay. All right, so in this whole section, part B, we are looking at just finding the limits. So in this class, you know, you, you do have a calculator and you can use your calculator, but if you're asked to do things showing your work or using algebra, then you need to understand the methods. There's really only three types of problems you're going to do algebraically, okay? Um, some obviously a little harder than others, but there's only three basic things. So the first thing before we get to those three is don't forget about direct substitution. So the property says if f is a polynomial or a rational function and the value a is already in the domain of your function, then the limit as x approaches a of f of x is f of a. So that's just, that means you're going to just plug in the value of the limit, plug it in, work it out, and get an answer. Okay, so examples three and four are examples of direct substitution. Now the thing is, a lot of times you don't know if it's going to work or not. So always, from this day forward, always plug in the number first and see if it gives you an answer. Okay, always do that. That's that's the number one rule of limits. So, because the thing is, as we go through these sections and through the course, we're going to learn all these different techniques Techniques if it's not a number. Okay, but sometimes you forget along the way that 
you can just plug it in because they'll, they'll always throw one or two problems in along the way where you don't have to do any work other than direct substitution. So kind of get it in your head that that's what you always want to check. Okay, No matter what, you always want to check. All right, so if we look at number three, the limit as x approaches five of two x plus two over x minus three. So the first rule of thumb is to do direct substitution. So let's see what we get. So we're gonna do two times five plus two over five minus three. Okay. If you get an answer, then that is the limit. So two times five is 10, 10 plus two is 12, and five minus three in the bottom is two. So we end up with 12 divided by 2, so we end up with 6. That is the limit. All right, the limit is theta approaches pi of the cosine of theta. So direct substitution would give me the cosine of pi. Okay, so you got to remember your trig values. Um, pi, remember on the unit circle, is over here. All right, there's pi. That ordered pair is negative one zero, and cosine is always the x value, so the cosine of pi is negative one. That is the limit. Okay? So if all problems were this nice, that would be great, but unfortunately, that's not going to happen. <laughs> so next thing is what we call indeterminate form. Okay? This is the second biggest thing that you always have to look for. So when you do your direct substitution for all limit problems and you see that your answer is going to be zero over zero, then that's what we call an indeterminate form. And if you get zero over zero, what that means is you actually can find a numerical answer. You will get an answer for these problems. It's not an undefined or no solution problem. Okay, so second big rule of thumb is if you do direct substitution and you come up with zero over zero, that is indeterminate form, which means you can keep working on this problem by either factoring it, simplifying it, or possibly multiplying by the conjugate to get to an answer, okay? All right, so these are the three types that we have. We're gonna do one of each just to kind of show you how that works, okay? All right, so again, first rule of thumb, plug it in and see what you get. So I'm going to plug in 4. The limit is x approaches 4 of x squared minus 16 over x minus 4. So if I do direct substitution, okay, I get 16 minus 16 in the top. I've got 4 minus 4 in the bottom. That gives me 0 over 0. Okay, so again, what that tells you is you can keep working this problem and simplifying it so that you can find the limit, okay? So the indeterminate form is hugely important because it tells you there is an answer. All right, so the first thing we're going to do on this problem is factor, okay? So that's the, the first thing we're gonna look at. So I know that I can factor the top, so I'm gonna do the limit as x approaches four. And by the way, as you work these problems with limits, as long as you're just simplifying, you have to keep the limit with the problem. Once you do direct substitution, then you no longer need that limit sign. So if you'll notice up here at number three, when I did direct substitution, I didn't write the word limit out here because I was, I was just doing an algebra problem. But right here, I'm just taking this and simplifying it. So I have to keep the limit with the problem. So I'm going to factor x squared minus 16. That factors x plus 4x minus 4. Bottom is x minus 4, can't do anything with that, okay? Now, I can cancel the x minus 4s, so that's going to leave me the limit as x approaches 4 of x plus 4, okay? That's what I'm left with. So all of this is still a limit problem. Once I've simplified, now I'm going to go back and try direct substitution again. And if I can do direct substitution this time and get an answer, that's my limit. So now I'm going to plug in 4 into x plus 4. So if I do direct substitution, 4 plus 4, I end up with 8. So there is my answer. So I couldn't find the answer in the original problem, but I was able to factor, simplify, and then I could do direct substitution. All right, let's look at number 6. Okay, Number 6, if I look at 
Okay, x plus 2 squared minus 4 over 2x. x approaches 0. I kind of already tell I'm going to have a problem because I'm going to get 0 in the bottom. But again, I'm going to do direct substitution. So I'm going to do 0 plus 2 squared minus 4 over 2 times 0. That's going to give me 2 squared minus 4 over 0. And 2 squared is 4. 4 minus 4 is 0. Now, why is it important to do this? Okay, I kind of should have stopped right there. Just when I saw that the bottom was 0, that's not good enough. Okay, When you do your direct substitution, both the numerator and the denominator must be 0. Okay, If you end up with a number on one of the two, then that's not an indeterminate form. So, you know, if I ended up with 3 divided by 0, then I couldn't do what I'm about to do. So, again, it's real important you check numerator and denominator. Both have to be 0. All right, so I am going to simplify this problem. Okay? I can't factor it. This is not a factoring problem. So what I want to do is simplify. So I'm going to go ahead and square x plus 2. So please remember, x plus 2 squared means x plus 2 times x plus 2, right? you got to FOIL that out. That does not just mean x squared plus 4. You can't just square the two numbers. You have to multiply x plus 2 times x plus 2. So we're going to FOIL that out. So first, limit as x goes to 0. We're going to do x times x, which is x squared. We're going to do the outer and the inner together. So 2x times 2x is 4x. And last is 2 times 2, which is 4. Then you have the minus 4 at the end, and 2x in the bottom. Okay. All right, so what can you get rid of, or what can you do here? I see I have a positive 4 and a negative 4. So now that brings me down to the limit as x approaches 0 of x squared plus 4x over 2x. All right, so that's simplified. Okay. Now, I'm going to try plugging in 0 again. But this time, when I plug in 0, I still get 0 squared plus 4 times 0 over 2 times 0. So I'm still getting 0 over 0. So that means i got to keep going. You know, there's more to do. Now if I look at this problem, hopefully you'd see in the top that you can factor out an x. So now I would go back and try factoring. Okay? Because remember, there is an answer. If you got this at the very beginning, there is an answer. Just when you get here and you say, oh, oh, well, that must be there's no solution. No, that's not true. That means there's still an answer. All right, so we're going to factor an x out of the top. That leaves you x plus 4 over 2x. Now what can we do? Okay, hopefully you'll see that you can cancel the x. So we're going to cancel that. So now that leaves you the limit as x goes to 0 of x plus 4 over 2. So now what do we do? Direct substitution again. Let's see. we got to keep going until we don't get 0 over 0. So now I'm going to put 0 into here. I'm going to get 0 plus 4 over 2. And finally, I can work that out. That's 4 over 2. So there's my answer. Okay? All right. So that's factoring, simplifying, just using basic algebra skills to try to get yourself to where you would end up with a numerical answer and not a 0 over 0. All right, number 7 is the last of this kind, which is multiplying by a conjugate. Anytime you see a radical pretty much with limits, you're going to use a conjugate. So you got to remember what the conjugate is and then how to work with it. Okay? All right, so first rule of thumb, let's plug it in and make sure we have an indeterminate form. So I'm going to let x go to 0, so I'm going to plug 0 in here. So the square root of 0 plus 16 minus 4 over 0. This is the square root of 16, which is 4. 4 minus 4 is 0. We know I already had 0 on the bottom. So we can work this out. We can get an answer. All right, so when you have radicals, whether they're in the top or the bottom, you're going to use a conjugate. So let me write the problem and remind you about the conjugate. All right, so there's the problem. So I have to do something with a radical. The only th way that I can do something with a radical is to use a conjugate to kind of get rid of it. So remember what the conjugate is, and you've got to be very careful with this. Conjugates always need two terms. So the first term is the square root of x plus 16. 
or is the other term. Conjugates have the same two terms, but the sign in the middle is different, not the sign of the first term. So the conjugate of that would be the square root of x plus 16 plus 4. And whatever you do to the numerator of a problem, you always have to do to the denominator, because now I'm just multiplying this problem by 1, which doesn't change the value of it. Okay? So please remember, conjugates two terms, and the sign, only the sign in the middle is different. All right. So now, I am going to simplify. So what you're going to do is you're going to FOIL the conjugates out, and you're going to leave the other part alone. So if the conjugates are on the top, you're going to FOIL that out, leave the bottom alone. If another problem has the conjugate in the denominator, then you're going to multiply the denominator out and leave the numerator alone. Okay, so wherever the conjugate is, that's the piece you want to simplify. Leave the rest the way it is. You don't have to mess with it. All right, so here's the nice thing about conjugates. When you multiply a radical times itself, remember that gives you the radical squared, so that undoes the radical part. So the square root of x plus 16 times the square root of x plus 16 is just x plus 16. And then with conjugates, all you have to do is multiply the last term, because the outer and the inner are going to cancel each other out because of the opposite signs. So all you got to do is the first, which we just did, and then the last. So negative 4 times 4 is negative 16. And then we're going to leave the bottom just the way it is. Okay? So no, don't worry about the bottom. All right, now we're going to simplify. So 16 minus 16 goes away. Okay. And then I will also, I see that I have x over x here, right? So I should write it out. I'm running out of room, but let me do that just so you see it. So I'm left with x over x times, right? So you can write this step out or not. I just wanted you to see that now you have the x's that cancel out, right? So now we're at limit as x goes to 0 of 1 over square root of x plus 16 plus 4. All right, so that's the simplified version of the problem. But now we have something different, and now we're going to try to plug in 0 again. So now we're going to go back to direct substitution. So 1 over square root of 0 plus 16 plus 4. That I can work out. Okay, 1 over... This would be the square root of 16, which is 4, plus 4. So I end up with 1 over 8. Need a little more room for that one, but okay. Now, those three problems make up basically all the types of problems for indeterminate form where you can simplify using algebra. They're just going to get a little bit harder. You know, different things are going to be asked of you to do. And we'll work on some more, but just to give you an idea of how those work, okay? All right. Now, I mentioned this earlier, but down here it says undefined form, okay? So remember, indeterminate form is 0 over 0. This says if the limit of x of, as x approaches a of f of x equals f of a is a number divided by 0, then the limit simply does not exist. That's not an indeterminate form. That's an undefined form. We're going to say it does not exist. Okay? All right. Now, this is real important, especially for those of you who took calculus before. For this section, that's true. Okay? So in your homework, when you're doing your homework, if you get a number divided by zero, the answer is done, does not exist. In the next few sections, 1, 5, and 1, 6, we're going to talk about kind of zeroing in on that actual answer, okay? Because these sometimes go to infinity and negative infinity, and so we're going to work on that. I believe it's section 1, 6. But for now, remember, we're starting this class from the beginning. So for section 1, 4, if you get this as a problem and you get this answer, then in WebWorks, you're going to put does not exist, okay? All right. So keep that in mind for the next problem. 
All right, so for number eight, we're going to do direct substitution. Always start with that. So the limit is x goes to 5 of x squared minus x minus 6 over x minus 5. So if we put in 5, see what we get. So see, here's one where I automatically know I have 0 in the bottom, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's indeterminate. So if you guys... If you guys just started factoring and trying to work it out, you're not going to get an answer because you didn't check the direct substitution. So remember, both of these have to be 0. And on this case, I'm not going to do that. I've got 25 minus 5 minus 6. 25 minus 5 is 20, minus 6 is 14. So that means I don't work this out. There's no algebra that can get me an answer. Automatically, it's going to be does not exist. Okay? Now again, in section 1-6, we are going to look a little bit farther into this and see maybe there is an answer. Okay, but for now, this is all we're going to do. So keep that in mind. This is not complete. It's just for now. All right. All right. So, Dr. Taylor mentioned this in the video when he did number 9 with you, but this is an important theorem. It's the basis of all the limit, basis of calculus. We say that a limit exists when the limit from the left equals the limit from the right. So this is the way that it looks using the notation. The limit as x approaches a of f of x equals l. This is a symbol in math that means if and only if. Sorry about that. Okay. If and only if the limit as x approaches a from the left of f of x and the limit as x approaches a from the right of f of x both equal l. Okay, that has to be true for you to answer the question, what's the limit as x approaches a? All right, so keep in mind, it's real important that you pay attention to what's asked of you, okay? So let's look at number 10. This is it. Now, a lot of you guys understand the limits. Some of you don't understand piecewise functions and what this means. So if you're having trouble with piecewise functions, let me know now because you're going to see them a lot. And if you're not sure where to plug things in or what things mean, then that's going to be a problem for you to answer the questions. Okay? So look at what number 10 is asking you to find. Three things. The limit as x approaches 2 from the left of h of x. The limit as x approaches 2 from the right of h of x. And the limit as x approaches 2 of h of x. Well, I can't answer the third part until I make sure that these two parts have the same value. If they have the same value, then that's the value for number three. If these have different values, then this would be does not exist. Okay? So you cannot find ever. If I didn't ask you these two questions now, for you to find this, you'd still have to do this on your own. Okay? So make, make that clear. You have to do all of these three, whether they ask you or not. Okay, so we're just kind of leading you into this, but typically you're just asked this. Okay, all right, so to find this, I have to do this. Well, when I have a piecewise function, then I'm basically going to plug in this value into whichever function goes with that number. Okay, so if I'm looking at numbers on the left side of 2, okay, here's 2. The left side, right side. So if I get close to 2, I'm looking at numbers on this side, okay, over here. So the only time I'm going to use negative 1 is when x equals 2. As long as x does not equal 2, I'm going to use this function, okay? All right. So if I'm approaching 2 from the left, then that means x does not equal 2, so I'm going to be using the top function. But I'm going to get really, really close to 2. Remember, I want numbers like 1 1.9, 1 1.999, 1 1.9999. I want as numbers as close as I can get. And I want to know what that is approaching. Okay? So we can put that in our calculator. We can go to the table. Or we can just kind of know, if I'm getting really, really close to 2, and I square the number... I'm going to get really close to 4, right? It's going to be very, very close to 4, 3.999 something. So the limit as x approaches 2 from the left 
is going to give me 4. That's what I'm going to get close to. Okay. Remember, it's not a function value. It's what I'm getting close to. Same thing from the right side of 2. From the right side of 2, I'm looking at numbers really close to 2 over here. 2.1, 2.001, So again, the numbers are getting really close to 2. Well, they're not 2, so I'm still using this function. And if I put anything really close to 2 and square it, I'm still going to get close to 4. Okay? And again, you can use your table, you can, you know, however you want to do that. But one of the things with piecewise functions is if you, if you have separated functions, you can still almost think about 2 in here. You know, if I plug 2 in there, I would get 4, and that's what those numbers are going to get close to. I, I know that. Okay? All right. So, what is the limit as x approaches 2 of h of x? Well, if both of these are the same, then the limit has to also equal that. Okay? Now, I know this is confusing for a lot of you, and, you know, yes, I could go to the table, so again, if you didn't believe me, you would go to your table, plug in x squared, because that's the function you're going to use when you're not using 2, and plug in numbers like this, right? You can do that. And you will see that these y values are going to get closer and closer to the number 4. So remember, that's how you find the limit if you're using the table, right? And then you could do the same thing with 2.1, 2.001, 2 2.001, get closer and closer to two, to 2 on the right side, you'll get those same values. Okay? All right. Last thing on this page is the squeeze theorem. So let's talk about that. Um, not that you're asked this a whole lot. You may have a web work problem on it. But this is just one of the theorems in the section which basically says if you have three functions, and you're trying to find the limit of the middle function, and you know that the, each function value is greater than the next, then the limit has to be the same as the two end functions if those two limits are equal. So let's look at this kind of and see what that means. So it says, if we have three functions, function f, function g, and function h, and remember these are the y values, Okay, and it says, and the limit as x approaches a of f of x equals the limit as x approaches a of h of x. And let's say both of those limits, they're just calling that a, l. But the limits are the same of the outer ones. Well, if the limits are the same of the outer two functions, then the limit of the middle function must be the same. Okay? So I'm going to try to draw you a little picture for that real quick just to see if it makes sense and then we'll do the problem on the next page, okay? All right, so let's kind of take a look at... All right, so here's the graph. Let's say we're going to put A over here. So here's A, okay? All right, and let's take function F. That's going to be the... The Y values will be the smallest. So let's say I just do a function like that. So here's F of X help if you could see it. There you go. All right, so here's function f, okay? And there's the limit as x approaches a, right? So we're going to call this value right here l. So if I asked you what's the limit of function f of x as x approaches a from the left and from from the left and from the right, I am approaching l, whatever that value is. All right. Now, I have function h from above, okay? So let's say function h looks like that. Here's h of x, okay? Well, the limit as x approaches a of h of x from this right-hand side and from the left-hand side are also approaching l. Well, let's now take g of x. So the whole point of this is that g of x is a function that we don't know how to work with. It's a hard function or it does crazy stuff. So let's say function g is this, maybe it's a trig function. It goes like this, and kind of crazy, right? It's just a crazy function. But right here at a, it squeezes through these two functions, okay? 
So whatever is happening elsewhere, right here at this point, function g, the limit is approaching that same value. It has to be. If it squeezes through there on the, on the graph, then this point has to, has to be the same. Okay? So that's kind of what this theorem says. So the whole point of this is if I can look at the outer two functions, which may be easier to deal with, and they have boundaries, then I could figure out the middle function no matter how hard it is because it has to have the same limit. Okay, so boundaries is the key. We need the boundaries. We need something with boundaries. All right, so let's look at number 11. This is a squeeze theorem. So let me, should be on the other page with your theorem, but this is a squeeze theorem problem. Okay, all right. I have no idea what to do with this problem. I got x times the cosine of 1 over x. I'm finding the limit as x goes to 0. You know, there's not a lot of algebra that I can do with this problem. So, what I, and I see that there's two functions. Basically, with the squeeze theorem, I, I kind of want to make sure I can deal with one function. So, if I look at the function x, that doesn't really have any boundaries. Right? That's just a linear equation, a line that goes forever. So I'm going to look at the cosine function. So here's where knowing your trig is going to be helpful to you. But I need a function. I want to start with a function that has the boundaries. So I'm going to start with cosine. And I'm just going to use theta okay, because it has boundaries. So you want to pick a function that you know has some boundaries. Why do I use cosine? Well, remember what cosine looks like. It has boundaries of 1 and negative 1, right? Looks like this. So no matter where you are on the cosine, whatever angle you find, the cosine values will always be between 1 and negative 1. So the angle in this problem happens to be 1 over x, but that's still the angle of the cosine function, okay? So I know that all cosine functions are between negative 1 and 1 equal to okay so that's that is true for all cosine values so I'm going to substitute in my angle that I have so that means this is true that's the angle in this problem all right so we found our angle our our function that had the boundaries and now I'm going to multiply in or add in the rest of this problem so the rest of the problem that I need to add in is the limit part as x approaches 0 of x, right, times the cosine. So I'm going to do this first so you can see it. So in the middle, I'm going to write the rest of the problem as it looked. That's what I'm trying to find, right? Okay. So I have part of the problem, the cosine part, and I know the boundaries. So now I'm bringing in the rest of this problem so that I... I'm actually doing what I'm supposed to be doing. So whatever I do to the middle, I got to do to the ends. So I'm going to add the limit as x approaches 0 of x times negative 1. And over here, I'm going to do the limit as x approaches 0 of x of positive 1. Okay? So again, algebra, just kind of keeping things equal. Whatever you do to one part, you got to do to the rest. All right, so now I want to find the limits of the endpoints. Remember, if I can get that these two limits on the ends are the same, then this has to be the same as that. All right, so simplify this a little bit. This is the limit as x approaches 0 of negative x. And over here, this is the limit as x approaches 0 of positive x, right? Middle, let's leave it alone for a minute. I'm really working with the outsides. All right. So, direct substitution. What is the limit as x approaches 0 of negative x? If you put in 0, negative 0 equals 0. So that is 0. All right. Middle stays the same. And then on the right, direct substitution, plug in 0, I get 0. So 
if the outside two limits have the same limit value, then by the squeeze theorem, the limit of what's in the middle must also be the same. So therefore, in calculus, we use these three little triangles. That means therefore, therefore, the limit as x approaches 0 of x times the cosine of 1 over x has to equal 0. Okay? So that is by the squeeze theorem we can do that. So you can only do this for problems where one of the functions in there it has a boundary, and that's the way that you have to start it. Okay? All right. Fun stuff, huh? Alrighty. All right, I'm going to stop this video here just because I'm already at 40 minutes. So if you want to take a break or whatever, or work on some web work problems, and then I'll do a part two video for this. Um, and both will be on, on Canvas, but this way it's kind of just not so long for you. All right, so I'll see you back here when you do the next part.